And what we're doing here is multiplex classification. So fundamentally, if you've got a, um, uh, an immunofluorescence image with a bunch of channels, how do you find your single level triple positives? As an aside, I highly recommend against trying to do two color chromogenic assays. Like there's kits out there for doing both DAB and a, a green chromogenic stain. And um, it's hard. It's really hard to separate them. Double positives just look, look exactly like brown. So if you've recently remade your cells, make a point of saving your data. You have to save it now. And then we're going to go to classify training images, create duplicate channel training images. And this gives you the option of, at this point, 20 images, each labeled with a single channel so that you can focus on what you're doing one channel at a time. You can make all 20 if you want, but I'm going to just make a couple. And I want to make CD4, CD20, and FOXP3. And I'm just going to turn off the others. If you leave them on, that's totally fine. If you just, you'll have a more complicated looking project. It is not actually duplicating your data. So don't worry about file size or anything like that. And then you can open up the CD20 and it looks the same. All of the channels are still there. You, you still have everything. The idea is this is just a neat, a neat way of organizing your project such that, you know, in this app, in this image, I'm going to deal with my CD20 classifier. In the next one, I'm going to deal with my CD4 classifier, and then I'm going to go back to my original and, and run it all and have this all saved and labeled and everything is nice. Classify training images, create duplicate channel training images. And I immediately regret not making more measurements. As long as you've saved yourselves first, and they'll be in every one of your files. From here, I'm going to turn on my first channel and I'm in the CD20 image. So I'm going to turn on CD20 and I'm going to turn off everything else. And then I'm going to make a CD20 classifier. You could do this however you want. You can make it a single threshold if you think that's going to be good enough. You can make it a, a trained machine learning classifier if you want to do that instead. That's what I'm going to demonstrate here because I think it works out a little bit better. <laughs> But it, it's really up to you and up to, up to your samples. Oh, one other fun trick is go to the annotations, go to the class list, right click, populate from image channels. And I'm going to not keep my existing classes. No. And now you have preset, yeah. <laughs> you have preset up all of the classes that you're going to need to make your multiplex classifier. So then I can click CD20, click auto set, click my brush tool and have at it. For right now, I'm only gonna spend like a minute or two per classifier because the point of this exercise is an accuracy, but obviously for your actual project, you wanna spend more than that. But, and this part's important, make your positive cells CD20 and your negative cells the ignore class. Don't make them other or or negative or anything like that. They have to be the ignore star. The main benefit, particularly for multiplex classifiers, is anything that is classified as ignore, it's just not going to write it down. So you'll have some, some cells that are CD20 and then some cells that are blank. And then when we then also add on the CD4s, you'll have some cells that are like CD4, but it's not going to say CD4, CD20 negative. It's just going to say CD4. And as you add more and more, just, you just want fewer words. <laughs> Classify, object classification, train object classifier. And I think this was a question from someone on the side of the audience yesterday. In this case, I actually, I only want to use my CD20 measurements. And, and hoist and autofluorescence, which tend to just be really useful across the board. I don't want to also include C4 or anything like that because then I can't compare them independently. Does this work? No. So I'm going to go to selected measurements, select. Um, I'm going to type CD20 and just select all of my CD20s. I'm going to uh, select all of my hoist 
and all of my auto fluorescence. Yeah, I'm going to make this classifier and then move on to the next image and not have to um, uh, not have to ever delete my annotations. Yeah, and it's all, like you could just do it one by one if you wanted to, but this is nicely labeled. It's all set up. It's one button. Yeah. Um, but once again, when you're selecting features, you have to type whatever you're going to type, select what you're going to select, and then delete delete the text here. If I were to hit apply right now, it would actually only use the autofluorescence channels. You have to like go back to the full list and then hit apply. Okay. So like I said, the point of this isn't to get like a super accurate uh, B cell classifier. It's just to like one, set up a classifier that like works well enough that you'll understand what the results mean. Okay. So I have my CD20 classifier. I labeled it CD20. I hit save. This is now written as a JSON file. How many people have gotten to this point? Then we're going to move on to CD4. So I saved my training data in the, lab the one labeled CD20. I've moved on to a new clean image. It, it still has all the cells. And then I can go scroll back up and do this one. Um, for this one, because the CD4s are kind of scattered, I'm going to use the points. Add. My yeah, first class is CD4, and click, 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 click. Yeah. I'm in the image labeled, like pre-labeled CD4. That way you never, it's very easy to go back to your CD20 image and correct your classifier if you want to. Yes, it should be either CD4 or ignore. Okay. If you are interested in, in making a good classifier, um, one of the things that I find helpful is for marking your negative cells, make a point of marking cells that are next to positive ones, because they will have like just a tiny little bit of CD4 in the membrane, and you want to specifically train QPath that this tiny little bit of If you only ever annotate the clean ones, it's easy. There isn't magic, I don't know, less than, I usually do like 20 and then see how my classifier looks like. If if your cells are super clean, five's enough. Pete showed an example in, a, in his talk yesterday where he annotated like two cells and it, it, it worked because it was just like, ah. In general, I find these random forest classifiers do a better job than a threshold in that like it'll get rid of if you have dim cells and you have autofluorescent cells, it'll, the pattern of, of like how what the cells look, that the spots look like, you can differentiate them so you can separate it. There's absolutely a sensitivity limit, and you'll just run into that. Um, my my general rule of thumb for myself is that if I look at a cell and I can't tell if it's real or not because it's kind of borderline, I'm never going to train a classifier to make it, which does not imply the opposite. Train something. To, to see what I can see, but if I can't see it, it was, it's not happening. <laughs> then do the same thing, train an object classifier, live update, and not this. For this, I'm only going to take the hoist, the autofluorescence, and the CD4. When you get to this stage in the filter and you're looking for your CD4s, you can type CD4, and what you'll see is CD45 and CD45 RO. And uh, I wish immunologists used different names for things. <laughs> they just don't. Uh, so you can't just blindly pit select all. Usually a space. So for, for CD4 specifically, you can type CD4 space and get it. Um, that will not work to differentiate CD45 and CD45 RO. You're going to have to click, click, click. And I, I didn't include it because it, it's not like, it's not usually necessary, but if you want to, including the cell shape parameters, uh, like area and perimeter, those are all perfectly valid metrics. Using what we talked about yesterday, you could figure out which, which features are the most important. The trick I like to use to... Make training the classifier a little easier. Select none and hit space. And it clears all of the red 
Um, Where's the text? that? Wow. And it, it just makes it a little easier to to find what you're missing, at least find the positives you're missing. If you still kind of can't see the false the false positives. We did just that. This is one person where they're drawing annotations around the cells, very, very high, high detail level, but they're not crossing any of the centroids of the cells. And you need to make sure you're crossing the centroid of the cell when you're drawing an annotation. Like, point tool can be anywhere. Yeah, I would do that. So if you turn off uh, annotations, uh, wait, I have to close this. There's nothing worse. If you turn off annotations and deselect them, they they go away. But if they're selected, they'll still show. So you have to. Oh, okay. So that's what it is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Okay. Who has a reasonable CD4 call classifier? Save it. Move on to Fox B3. This might be more of a personal note, but for more groups that are expected to be localized in nucleus and nucleus alone, such as transcription factors like Fox B3, I personally like to use only Fox B3 nucleus related features. But you know, your mileage may vary. It might be better uh, to use all features as shown before. Up to you guys. <laughs> Because the Fox B3 is actually the cleanest of the markers we've looked at, I'm actually not even going to bother training. I'm just going to make a single measurement classifier. And as Mark said, I'm going to use nuclear Fox P3. Once you load up the single measurement screen, the measurement list is a lot. So you can go to your channel filter, pick Fox P3, and then it'll just limit this, um, see what's relevant. Non-detections, and let's find... Oh, and when you do that, it like auto sets that your box special should be box P3. It really, and, and that your class fire name should be box P3. It tries to make this as easy as we can. Oh, you do have to hit live preview or nothing happens. Yes. That's, that's yes. I, I just had a quick question. So for the low threshold, is it better to leave it blank or ignore? Either. Okay. But they'll so it'll, it'll boast like the negative population will still be remain on class Yeah. Okay. What negative? Yeah, negative. don't call it negative. You will regret that. Why is that? In the final result at the end, you're going to have a bunch of things that say negative, and it's not going to be clear what it refers to. So you end up with like a box B3, negative, negative, negative. That's when it's just box B3. Okay, let's say you had time to complete a project on the y-axis and number of markers on the on the x-axis. Yeah. What does that graph kind of look like? To do it right, to do all of Shreepad's validation, to do to QC everything, to classify everything correctly. Yes, it's absolutely exponent. However, as you get the number of markers, you get just in practice as you talk to people, loose about some of these things. You don't actually do all of your PCs every time. You don't actually, you just say, and eh, here's a threshold, I'm done. You need to publish and run your license. This is one of the reasons I'm actually not a fan of a hundred plus. Okay, who's got three classifiers? Woo! Woo! Okay, here's what we're gonna do. Go back to the original. So now you, we should have cells, which are hidden because I hid the none cells and none of these are classified. Okay. Classify, object classification, create composite classifier. And I'm going to add my B cells, my CD4s, and my T regs together. The order changes the final order in which they will be listed. So if you want to see CD4 positive, Fox P3 positive, add them in that order. If you reverse them, it'll say Fox P3, CD4, but it won't actually change the numbers. Like it doesn't, it's not, that, that's purely aesthetics really. And then give this combined classifier a name like B cell helper, like whatever you want to call it. Which order it like appears in the annotations tab depends on which cells are actually present. And I think the location of the cells. When you go to export measurements, it'll combine that into one, like all the columns will match and everything will be there. If that's truly all you want, 
then a classifier trained on just both channels of information yeah. would likely get a slightly better response out of it because there is more relevant information that goes into your classifier. What I, however, I don't actually recommend trying to clean many classes in one classifier. Like what we've been doing this whole time is two classes at a time, like a positive and a negative. You can absolutely include three, four, ten classes in a single classifier. We did that once. We did others inflamed and at the bottom. I, in practice, and I'm not a machine learning expert, but in practice, I find like the more classes you add, you need eat, like exponentially more training data. It's like, it's not just like double, it's, it's like, it's more, and there's just more mistakes to be made, more, more issues. So unless you, sorry, I, I try not to do that unless I want to absolutely be certain there could never possibly be a double positive and I want to force something to either be a CD or, or CD8. There's never, there's no choices other than that. I have my composite, I'm saving and applying. So now I have many colors on one graph. Um, we have it, uh, including 4,000 B cells. When it says CD20 here, num CD20, that is sing CD20 single positive. It is not adding in everything else. We have 30, uh, 752 non Fox P3 CD4s and 339. What I really wanted to bring your attention to were these, which is something FreePad brought up. The way we did this is going to allow for impossible combinations. I actually like seeing these because it's a measure of accuracy of your classifiers. It means like something, one of these is too, is not specific, at least a little bit. It, it's actually very likely due to the four segmentation. It's the thing where it's getting both CD20 membrane and CD4 membrane into the same cell, and then it's you rather reading them both as positive. Um, so you can't tell from this number exactly where the failure was, but having 1,100 known to be impossible combinations out of 8,000 is bad. <laughs> There are better methods of that, um, like we, like distant me metrics. If you really want that information, this is just kind of uncomfortably. You don't really know what it is. I, sorry, I wouldn't use this as like a readout in a figure. What I would do is try different segmentation methods, yes. see which one gets you the least crazy results. And and it's also a way. It's a sensitivity test. In this particular case, I know. Oh God, twelve percent of my B cells are wrong. So I better not be quantifying any differences smaller than this time. I'm going to go to my class list, and instead of populating from the image from the images, I'm going to populate from my existing objects without keeping available classes to make this a little cleaner. Here's all the choices. Here's every cell. The classifier is exactly getting what is segmented the segmentation chunk. So let's say that, okay, I see that there's a double positive that should be there. And go back and I want to prove the training of the CD4. You have to go back from, back to this step and like re-add it all. Yeah, this now just exists. And I can, like I can apply this one instead yeah. or anything else. If you make cell stardust cells and then separately make cube path built in cells, they'll have almost the same measurements. Like they'll, they'll automatically measure the mean intensity and everything, but the actual string name of the measurements is slightly different. So when you try to apply the classifier from one to the other, it's going to fail. I thought about it as a bug, but it's actually a feature. Um, I think it, I think that's why he did it is to make it impossible to switch those. Well, after the workshop, I spent just a little bit of time trying to optimize the analysis of this slide a little bit better than what I could do live on stage, and I just wanted to show you the results of that. Uh, first, I used a Stardust to segment the cells, and um, as you can see here, uh, the accuracy is actually pretty decent. It's not perfect, and if you go around, you can definitely find mistakes, like it, it lost a cell here, and 
uh, there's something weird going on here. But overall, um, for as dense and as complex as this issue is, uh, Stardust does a remarkably good job. Um, I also trained uh, three classifiers, uh, a CD20, CD4, and FOXP3, just like I did in the, in the workshop. Um, and in this case, I spent about 45 minutes uh, trying to get them uh, correct, which is, of course, more time than I could spend uh, live. Um, but in total, if we run the, the um, run the uh, combined classifier, which I called CD20, CD4, Fox P3, hit apply. This might take a couple seconds. All right. And after a couple of seconds, you can see the results. The yellow is the CD20. Uh, the uh, well, the, the true red is the unclassified, which I'll get rid of. Uh, the brown is the CD4s, and the pinks are the Fox uh, P3s. And if you look over here on the left, you can see the uh, numbers of each type of cell. And overall, there are 65,000 CD20, of which just over 200 are some combination of impossible cells. So that's CD20 CD4 or CD20 Fox P3. Um, so that's less than 1% uh, error rate. Um, so it's something like 0.3% error rate, which is just about the best you can expect out of a classifier. Um, I should mention that's a 0.3% definite error rate. There's probably other mistakes somewhere in here. But overall, um, it looks much better. Uh, I spent about 45 minutes improving these classifiers, not an insane amount of time for um, how big and complex this tissue is. Um, and uh, this gets you to perfectly good, perfectly reasonable uh, results.